So yesterday, we um, looked at a book, we looked at a piece of text. Um, it's called The Case of the Missing Carrot Case. And Tamaya, can you remind me what happened in our book yesterday? Uh, the rabbit was concerned because she was making cakes and then she was making carrot cakes and then they would end up missing during the night. And so how did the uh, conflict get solved? Uh, the cops uh, that were investigating it, they put cameras on the owl's tree and by the cake that they had made. And then that's when they saw the rabbit. She had she was fully walking and she had ate the cake. Okay, good. So rabbit was missing her cake. They did a whole investigation trying to figure out who was eating her cakes. And then in the end, they found out that it was actually rabbit who was eating her own cakes in her sleep. Okay. Was our text yesterday fiction or nonfiction and why? Uh, let's go with Maya. It's fiction because, um, because it's, um, because it doesn't have like real facts or anything. Right, very good. So it doesn't have any real facts. It's a made up story. Mice don't really walk. Mice don't really talk uh, like we do. Um, mice are, cannot be police. They cannot be investigators. Um, so, you know, owls don't really talk. Rabbits don't talk. They don't bake cakes. It's not, I've had a rabbit. I promise you they do not bake cakes. So, you know, they had a human, you know, human like characters, however, because that cannot factually happen, it is fiction. Very good. So we're going to look at um, at an article today. It's about a dog detective. And with that article, it's going to be a nonfiction article, meaning that it is factual. So when we're looking at a piece of nonfiction text, what are some of the things that we're looking for to help us understand the story? Alasia, what's one thing we look for in nonfiction texts that help us understand the story or the article? The theme. We can have a theme in a nonfiction text. What's something else, Tamaya? Conflict. We won't have conflict. So we're not looking, we're not thinking about uh, plot elements or anything like that in nonfiction. What are we thinking about in nonfiction? Um, the settings. Mm -mm. That's, that's fiction. When I'm reading an article, what's something that I have that helps me understand what that article is mainly trying to teach me or get me to learn? The facts in the story. So that's the facts in the story, but there's there's a specific word that we always that we always think about. Um, we always look at. It starts with text, and there's a second word that goes. Text features. Text features. Good. So we have text features within our. Um, we have text features within nonfiction text that help us find what? It starts with a C. We use text features to find the what? Central idea. The central idea, good. So we use text features to find the central idea. We're gonna go ahead and look at our um, vocabulary video for for our text features, and then we will read our um, and then we will read our article. I believe this is the right one. Okay, so let me share my screen with you. Uh-oh, hold on, there we go. Okay. I'm pretty sure this is the right one. If it's not, I'll turn it off. Hmm. 
Wait. It may be text structures. Let me see. No, it's text features. That's right. Because remember, it wasn't it the one with the sloth? Let's watch this one. Okay. As always, if you cannot hear it, make sure that you let me know. And here we go. Leo here just found out he has to do a report on sloths. He checks out a nonfiction book. The title is All About Sloths. Hmm, this is a little bit different from the fiction books that he's been reading. It's got all these text features. Those are the things that draw his eye to important information and help him understand all the interesting facts. Leo's gonna use those text features to find his way around the text. Yo, Leo opens the book. It looks like nonsense till he looks in the front for the table of contents. It's nothing like the table in his kitchen. Uh, it lists big topics with a short description. Leo sees chapter two is called Sloth Habitat. He starts on page 15. He flips to that at the top of the page. Just as expected, it says Sloth Habitat in very big letters. That's called a heading. It helps him figure out what this section of the book is all about. There are sub Headings too. The chapter's divided by smaller headings like trees and climate. Leo sees a picture that makes him laugh. A sloth hanging from a branch, that's a photograph. It was taken with a camera, put in the book to show us how a sloth really looks. Underneath the photo, there's a quick description. That's a caption. It tells you what's in the picture. Leo starts to wonder what's a sloth diet. There's a text feature that'll help him find it. It's called the index. All topics of importance are listed in the back in ABC order. Leo spots diet that was easy to find. It's on pages seven through nine. Feeling lost in the book that's non-fiction. Text features will point you in the right direction. The captain has a compass, the pilot has a map. You can use text features to find facts. Feeling lost in the book that's non-fiction. Text features will point you in the right direction. The captain has a compass, the pilot has a map. You can use text features to find facts. Leo keeps reading. It's making him think. He sees that some species of sloths are extinct. Extinct is bold. What's up with that word? It's bold because it's something new to learn. It could be italicized or underlined. Want to know what it means? It's easy to find. In the back of the book, there's something called a glossary. Where new words are defined properly. It's an ABC order. Leo looks through the list. He sees extinct means it no longer exists. Now he's flipping through the pages. Hang on, man. He spots a cool image called a diagram That's a picture that shows different parts of something So Leo knows how it works, how it functions There are labels that point out different parts Like stomach, lungs, and its loving heart This table compares sloths to giraffes We can also compare with a chart or a graph These are visual ways of organizing data So long sloth, we'll see you later Peace out Uh I said we'll see you later. Ugh, I forgot how slow these guys are. Feeling lost in the book that's non-fiction. Text features will point you in the right direction. The captain has a compass, the pilot has a map. You can use text features to find facts. Feeling lost in the book that's non-fiction. Text features will point you in the right direction. The captain has a compass, the pilot has a map. You can use text features to find facts. All right, so let's head over to our article for the day. It's called Dog Detectives. And I'm going to open the magazine view so that we can see how it would look in actual scholastic magazines, just like the ones that we had in class, okay? Okay, so dog detectives. These dogs use their sensitive noses to help scientists study endangered animals. Jack, Jack weaves through a forest in Washington state, his nose to the ground. The six-year-old Australian cattle dog mix has caught a whiff of something intriguing. He's determined to follow the scent trail to its source. Jack isn't sniffing in the forest for fun. 
He's a detection dog for rogue detection teams. That conservation agency trains dogs to locate traces of wild animals for scientists to study. Often this means sniffing out their scat or dropping. I can tell when Jack picks up a scent, says Colette Lee. She's Jack's handler and a research scientist, rogue detection team. His mouth tightens, his nostrils twitch, and his tail starts to wag like crazy. The samples the dogs find give scientists important information. Substances in their droppings provide clues about the diet and health of the wild animal they came from. If scientists discover problems affecting the animals, they can take action to help them. The nose knows. Dogs excel at all kinds of detective work because they are superior sniffers. Their sense of smell is 10,000 times more sensitive than a human. That allows them to sniff out far away odors that humans can't smell at all, like tiny bits of animal scat. Droppings give off odor molecules, tiny particles that carry scents through the air. When a dog sniffs, cells inside its nose called scent receptors capture these molecules and send signals to the brain. The brain then determines what the smell is from. Your nose works the same way. But dog noses have at least 50 times more receptor cells than human noses do, says biolog biologist Pascal Quignard. That allows dogs to smell very, let me go to the next page. Very faint scents, like the slime trail left behind by a snail. Sniffling, sniffing school. The dogs that work for rogue detection teams are rescue dogs that once lived in shelters. To teach the dogs how to find certain scat samples, trainers present them with droppings from different species. They hide the samples in boxes with holes. When the dogs sniff the hole that covers the target scat, they get a ball. That teaches the dogs that finding that specific sample earns them a reward. They quickly figure out that they have to find exactly what the exactly the kind of sample we want in order to play, says Yi. Eventually, the training moves outdoors where there are many more distractions. Recently, Jack was part of a study to learn if detection dogs are more accurate than humans at finding baby birds and bats that have died. The animals' tiny bodies are often hidden in cracks in the ground or covered by leaves. The humans in the study only found 30% of the birds and bats. Jack sniffed out more than 90%. Not all dogs are cut out for the job. We need dogs that are really energetic and completely obsessed with balls, says Yi. It's basically a game for them. The smell of success. Jack has been working as a detection dog for four years. He can identify the smells of more than a dozen different species. His work is helping scientists monitor endangered animals from bats to gray wolves. Based on the number of droppings Jack finds, scientists can estimate the size of a species population. Bits of prey in the droppings can tell scientists what the animals are eating. Hormones or, and other chemicals can indicate if the animals are pregnant or if they have toxic substances in their body. Recently, Jack has been working with Yi to relocate orca scat off the coast of Washington. The snot-like substance floats on the water's surface. For a human, it's not easy to see. From a boat, Jack can catch the scent of the oily droppings from more than 500 meters away. Researchers from the University of Washington are studying the scat to find out why orca numbers are shrinking. Rogue detection teams is working with scientists to come up with a new way to come up with new ways to put the dog's sniffing skills to use. For instance, some dogs are learning to find trees with certain diseases. So far, there don't seem to be lit to be limits to what these dogs can do. All right. So when we read a nonfiction text, we just talked about this. The first thing that we're going to look for is what are some of our text features. Bryant, can you give me a text feature that you see here?
Bryant. Yes. I can't hear you. What's a text feature that you see on this page? Brian, what is this called? This right here. A text what? feature? It's a text feature, but what is that? A picture. It's a picture. Now, is this an illustration or is it a photograph? Photograph? How do you know that it's a photograph and not an illustration? To illustrate means to 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 write to draw. Okay, and then to photograph means to take a picture. Take a picture. So, did they draw this picture, or did they take the picture? Draw this one. This picture, did they draw that picture or did they actually take the picture with the camera? Take a picture. They took a picture with the camera. Very good. So that is considered a photograph. Very good. Maya, what's another text feature that we see here? We have bold words. Bold words. So we have endangered. Hold on. There we go. We have endangered, is it, is it doing it? Is it highlighting? It's not gonna highlight it for me, but we have endangered, we have hormones, um, we have species. So we have multiple, I'll do that. We have endangered, we have hormones, we have species. So we have multiple bold words on our, um, in our article. And what do those bold words tell us, Maya? What do they tell us? The, um, why it's, um, it tells you the meaning of it. It tells you that it's, does it tell you the meaning or does it, sometimes it does, but it doesn't always tell us the meaning just because it's bold. It's bold so that it can get our what, get our what, what you're trying to get from us. Uh, Would you have noticed the word if it wasn't bold? No. No, so it does that to get our attention. It does it for us for that word to stand out to us so that we know um, that's a word that we need to be looking for or, you know, that we need to, that's important to what's going on in our text. Good. Tamaya, what's another text feature that we see? So we talked about, we see a photograph or photograph, the most of photographs. We also talked about the fact that we see um, bold words. What's something else that we see? Subtitles. Subtitles. Are they subtitles or are they something else? Um, You're close, but it starts with an H. Uh, wait. So this is considered this isn't even considered a subtitle. These dogs use their sensitive noses to help st scientists study endangered animals. Remember, if I have a subtitle, my subtitle is going to come right under my t actual title, okay? When I have these that come over my sections of text, remember, these are considered headings. 
They're not subtitles, they're headings, okay? Those are two that y'all get confused. So remember, a subtitle is always gonna be right underneath the title. If it's not right underneath the title, that means that it's considered a heading, not a subtitle, okay? You're so close, thank you, Tamaya. Um, Alasia, give me another one. A caption. Good. We have our captions inside of our pictures. Uh, they are describing the actual picture is very good. Ladarian, can you give me a um, text feature? Ladarian? Okay, I'll come back to them. Maya, what's this? What is this called? This part right here. What is this telling us? What information is this part right here giving us? Let me let me um, take it off that and server so that you can see. What information is this piece right here giving us? Of the bold words. Right, it's giving us the bold words, but it's telling us what they mean. What they mean. So if I have a section within my text that's telling me what they mean, what is this considered? Alasia, what's the name of this? <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. A sidebar? It's not a sidebar. Starts with a G. A glossary. A glossary. Yes, yeah, so this is the glossary. It's telling us what the words that are bolded within the text mean, okay? So we've gone through, we've looked at um, majority of our text features. What is the central idea of this article? Tamaya, oh, Maya didn't, no, you didn't. Tamaya, what is the central idea of my article? Go ahead. Um, helping dogs, like, like the dogs helping people. Helping people using what? Uh, detective dogs. But what do detective dogs use to help people? They investigate. They use their what? Oh, nose. To help people how? Um, like find, like find missing, like find missing things. So find missing animals. What else? Um, um, you gonna find somebody? Um, oh, help them find like people that were missing. Not people that so we do have dogs that do that, but we're not talk. This article is not talking about those kind of dogs, it's talking about the kind of dogs that use their nose to help scientists find, like you said, animals. So that would be the central idea. Dog, dog detectives help scientists find um, animals based off of using their nose, period, right? Then everything else, you know, what, what kind of animals are they looking for? What are they looking for when they, like, what do they use to look for the animals? They use their droppings or their poop right to find the animals all that is extra information but our central idea is that these dog detectives are helping adam helping scientists find animals using their nose okay so i'm going to show you your assignment for today remember as always you'll go to clever 
And then to get to the assignment instructions, you will just click assignment instructions and it will take you here. If you click nonfiction read aloud, it will take you back to um, the actual article. Now, let's say you don't want to read the article. You want to listen to the article. There is um, a part over here to the side that will say text to speech. Let me make sure that my, yes. That will say text to speech. Dog detectives. These dogs use their sensitive noses to help scientists study endangered animals. By hail. Okay, y'all heard that? So it will read it to you. There's also a video here that you could watch. And it talks about um, the, the dogs and like what the jobs are that they have. Um, not those specific dogs, but it just talks about different dogs in general. What are some of the jobs that dogs have um, in general? And um, and see, it has like a another diagram here that tells you how their nose works and things like that. So it just has the, but it's the same article. So it has all the information that you're going to need if you forget or if you need to go back into the text. It's there for you. If you do want to open up the um, the magazine view of it to get where this is, you would just push. Hold on. You would just push. Um, open magazine view and it'll take you to here okay all right so your assignment for today is very similar to yesterday it is a um choice board so you'll go through and you'll look at these one of these six choices and within these six choices you'll make a decision on what um what activity you want to complete when you complete that activity take a picture of it and then send it to me on class dojo okay here are the six I'm not gonna fully go through uh, through them with you just for the sake of time because we've we've run a little bit over. Um, but these are where this is where you're gonna go, and then after you're done with your assignment, make sure that you log in to Imagine uh, Learning Language and Literacy. Does anybody need help? Do I need to show you how to get to Imagine Learning again, or does everybody know how to get to Imagine Learning? Is there anyone that does not know how to get to Imagine Learning? Okay, so if, as always, hold on, there we go. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message on Class Dojo. I will get um, back, I have a couple of meetings today, but I will get back to you um, as soon as I can. So um, if nobody has any questions, I will see y'all tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Bye.